friends, it's a real pleasure to me just to sit here under this lovely shade tree, which if I know anything about trees, it would be beautiful in spring. I think it's a Judas tree, or red bud as some people call it. Well, we're in the Anderson Park over on the Tennessee side today. And as I sit here looking down through the park all around me, these big trees now shade everywhere. I uh, am grateful and thankful that we have a park here like this. I know that I, like many others, should take advantage of it more often. Relax a little during the busy day and come here and sit and enjoy what we've got. It's a real jewel in the midst of a busy, active city. I can look all around and see commercial buildings, a residence or two, and things have so changed here since this park was laid out many years ago. But best of all today is that lovely, lovely dense shade that's created by these trees. Well, you know, we have some teaching of history in Bristol, but I wonder just how many of you out there, and I wonder how many in time past, could actually tell us how this park came to be. My estimate is that there would be maybe one in 5,000 that could tell you. That doesn't mean that no one knows about the place. It's very much frequented. When I came today, there was an entire group of children in here playing. I guess it must have been from a daycare center or something or other. Anyway, they're gone now. But as I look around, I see one person taking a nap. I see one person sitting doing sewing. Well, why not? Why not bring your work here? I made a resolution a while ago that I'm gonna bring my writing pad when I get to the inspiration for a story and bring it over here instead of sitting in a hot house and all kinds of uh, interruptions to be right here in the park and do it. Well, the immediate history of this park is not so old, but when it existed as a plan and as an intention in the mind of a man, it goes back to the very beginning of Bristol. Bristol is here, of course, because of the railroad. And when it came apparent, became apparent that two railroads were gonna meet here, Joseph R. Anderson, who founded the city of Bristol, Tennessee, Virginia, had an, had an idea. He had a friend, well, a cousin, I think, Henry Anderson, a surveyor to lay out the town for him. He bought 100 acres from his father-in-law, Reverend James King, and this land goes back to the Kings to 1814, but it goes further than that. He bought it from the Shelby heirs. The Shelbys bought it about 18, or 1772, and before that, it was a tract of land owned by John Taylor of East Virginia. So it's got a long past, but let's come down to the time that Anderson bought it. He had his cousin, or whomever it was, same name, to lay out the town. He got an idea that he ought to leave a square as a place for a future park. So in that respect, it dates back to 1852 when the town was laid out in August, beginning of August the 2nd, 1852. His idea was this. He said the town's gonna to develop. He had all faith that it would. It'll grow into a big city someday. That was his hope and he really felt that it would. In that case, he said, I think I need to leave a square for a place for my children and my grandchildren and maybe great-grandchildren to play. And not only mine, but the children of others. I want a place for them where they can always enjoy outdoor work, re recreation. And so it was that he chose this spot in the lower end of his property 
to be saved for a park. He sold lots all around it, but he did not encroach on his part he had laid aside. Never. I'm sure he was tempted to at times when people were begging for lots. They went fast, and I suppose that he did sometimes think, well, maybe I should sell it, but he didn't yield to temptation, and he went ahead and left it here. Now, he didn't let it just lay out as a thicket of run over place in the middle of town. He used it for a good purpose until the town developed. He put out fruit trees here. He had several apple trees and two or three pear trees and grape vines. Uh, he believed in being self-sufficient as far as he could. And so he set out fruit trees and vines of all kinds and he made a potato patch here, had it as long as he lived, and he also had a vegetable garden, a large vegetable garden. And even after he became the wealthiest man in town, became the town's biggest banker, biggest landowner, and biggest merchant, he was well, well, well healed in with the good wealth. But even so, he remained very thrifty. And part of that thrift was this. He did most of the work in his vegetable garden. He might work a while in the bank, go by home, put on old clothes, and come up here and work among his vegetable garden, in his vegetable garden. He had a big potato patch here. Once before on this program, I told the story of how he dug his own potatoes and how one day he hired a little boy to help him and how he gave that boy a dollar, silver dollar, and told him, if you keep it and add to it constantly, someday you'll be richer than I am. Well, that came to pass. That little boy became a great contractor in Dallas, Texas, and his fortune grew into millions. I have the dollar. It was given to me before the man died. But I don't think I'm going to grow it into a million dollars. Well, be that as it may, I, if you've been a viewer of this program since it began, you probably remember that because I got more comment and uh, more uh, compliments on that program than anyone I ever have done. But Anderson left us in 1888 in May. He died of typhoid. By that time, he had built a fine home, a large mansion, inside of where I sit today, just over to the west here. It was on Anderson Street. This was back of it. But it was his, he had to die like all of us will eventually and leave plans behind. But the family didn't go against this plan. Of course, they inherited the lot. And they intended to go ahead and do as their ancestor had said this should be done. Now they did operate it as a garden and orchard after they moved out to the new house and after he died. He only got to live in his new home about five, six years, I guess, seven. But after he died, the family still operated the orchard and the vegetable garden for a while. And then there came a time when they decided it was the time was ripe, that it ought to be turned into a park. I regret very much that I don't know the exact date, but it was somewhere, I think, before, just before 1900. I know it was in operation by 1900, and I know it was operating full blast by 1901. Somewhere, and when I say somewhere in my old home, Pleasant Hill, it could be anywhere. But somewhere I have a picture of this park when it first opened. At that time, there were no big shade trees in here. It had still been cleared off for vegetable garden and the, no trees, but all over the area, there were little sprouts of trees, none of them over three feet tall at that time. But. I don't know the date of the picture, but I would guess that it's late 1890s or very early 1900s. 
I do know that when it first opened, it was, wasn't as much a playground as it was a public assembly place. The town used it as a place to gather in summertime when they're speaking or whatever activity. For years, there was an annual picnic here on the 4th of July. I, I don't remember that being done in my time, but it was. There was a picnic here for years on the 4th of July. Well, then, in time, it became a place, as he had envisioned, for children and probably some of his own descendants to play here. But there again, in the first earliest years, it was used more as an assembly place than it was for play. I've been told that a platform was erected here under a shade tree and that a podium was built for speakers could use it. At one time, I know it was 1901, William Jennings Bryan, he made several runs for president, you know. He was much liked in this country. He was very well thought of. And so he in, had arranged for a speaking engagement here. And while he was speaking, Mr. John C. Anderson, a son of Joe Anderson, who gave us the part, he was here listening very intently to the speech. Well, he would have been, uh, at that time, he was in his 50s. He's a, he was born in 1850, so he'd been slightly over 50 years old. But he had remarried a younger woman, and she was over at the house. It didn't come because she was expecting. And they had an old ex-slave woman cooking for them. I, I think they called her Aunt Mahaley or something like that. I've been told stories about her many times. But John happened to look around and he saw Miss Mahaley uh, coming pretty fast right across toward the park. She slipped up behind him and whispered in his ear that you better come home quick because the baby's about to be born. Well, he did go home quickly, and I think was able to get old Dr. M. M. Butler to come to the house to take care of the birth. Well, the girl born that day is a little baby girl. She grew up here, taught school. They called her Margaret after her Aunt Margaret. Uh, that'd be her mother's sister. And uh, she grew up here, taught school for a while and married, finally married Harry M. Piper. He was, came here and married her first cousin first. And I've heard her say many times that she used to call that first cousin's husband Mr. Piper, never dreaming that she'd ever marry him, but she did. And that lady lived till well into my time here. I interviewed her two or three times and I got a lot of history from her, including the story of this part. There came a time about 1969, 68, 69, 70, somewhere right in that vicinity. A big move was on here called urban renewal. And there's changing about everything. Tore down many of our best old landmarks, including the Anderson home. It went down during that time. Somebody decided that this square in here would be a good place for the Sullivan County, or for the Bristol, Tennessee, rather, courthouse. And so it almost became the court square. They had all the heirs to sign papers agreeing to it, and they did. But for some reason, that didn't happen. I don't know. I don't know what happened. But that plan failed to go through. And frankly, I'm happy that it did fail we wouldn't have this beautiful shady spot in the middle of a busy city today if it were not for what decision was made by somebody or some group not to go ahead. We're here, people are here, I see them every day when I pass, and I think with gratitude to Joseph R. Anderson that he had foresight enough and intention strong enough and a generous heart to donate this to us. And we here, he's been gone a long, long time now, but we here today are enjoying 
the benefits of his gift. And you now know the rest of the story. And I hope you, every time you come here or see people enjoying here, take a little moment to, in gratitude, remember the founder of Bristol and how he gave us such a lovely spot that what became such a lovely spot. Until we meet again, I say may the best in life be yours.